This discussion of Netflix's The Witcher Season 3 was recorded in July 2023 prior to the Hollywood writers and actors' strikes. Uh, it makes me so sad because, like, I obviously make all of the thumbnails and the artwork for the podcast episodes. Right. And I try to do it to the title of the longest episodes so that they just get shorter, but they're all consistent throughout the season. So part one came out and the longest episode title was The Art of Illusion. And I was like, oh, great. So I'll use this font size and it'll all fit. And then I get the screeners for part two, and it's just like, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. How is that going to fit on my thumbnails? Oh, my God. <laughs> Maybe it could be like, everyone has a plan until dot, 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 and just an image of a guy getting punched in the face. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Ship it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Breakfast in Beauclair, a global Witcher podcast. My name is Alyssa from Good Morin, and I'll be your host. As you, I, and our international Hansa accompany Geralt of Rivia and his destiny, Cyrilla of Sintra, across the continent. Recently, I was on an episode of The Newest Olympian. I know a lot of you originally found it from Mike Schuber and The Newest Olympian, so I was back. You can hear me on episode 133 covering The Lost Hero, chapters 15 and 16 from the Heroes of Olympus series. Heroes of Olympus and the Percy Jackson books in general have a lot that I think fans of The Witcher will love, so please be sure to check it out. And again, you can listen to my episode at The Neost Olympian, episode 133. And as another reminder, Peculiar Radio is still an award-winning show. Hooray! So you can find that wherever you're listening to this podcast, by looking for Peculiar Radio. This episode, we welcome Lisa C. to the Hansa, who joins our producer-level patrons on Patreon, Katie, the Redhead of Tucson, Jacob B., Charlotte from Vengerberg Glamourai, The Original Roach, Libby, John of Riblia, Tom from Australia, Jill Kate the Tabby Witch, Ollie from Sweden, James Carson III, Miriam of Tamaria, and Softy. If you would like to learn more about supporting Breakfast in Beauclair, visit patreon.com slash breakfast in Beauclair. As for this episode, Michelle from the U.S. and Oleg from the U.S. call in for Netflix's The Witcher, episode 305, The Art of Illusion. Join us as we discuss the efficacy of nonlinear storytelling, the morality of neutrality, the characters and audiences' big red herring, and our thoughts on the mid-season finale. Without further ado, let's get to our discussion of Netflix's The Witcher, episode 305, The Art of Illusion. Welcome to Breakfast in Beauclair. My name is Alyssa, and today we're welcoming two members of our Hansa to the show. My first guest is originally from California, but now resides in Mexico City, where she works as both a reader for various entertainment studios, as well as the co-founder of independent Kobacha Studios. She's currently working on Kobacha's second feature film as a script supervisor, assistant art director, and lead animator. You'll recognize her from her appearance on Breakfast in Beauclair, episode 73, 103 of Warriors, Wakes, and Wondrous Worlds from Netflix's Blood Origin. My second guest is originally from Russia and now lives in the U.S. You'll recognize him all the way from Breakfast in Beauclair, episode 5, The Edge of the World. He's a big fan of fantasy books and games, including The Witcher, and enjoys role-playing in Dungeons and Dragons. Please welcome Michelle from the U.S. and Oleg from Russia. Hey, guys. Hi. How's it going? It's good Hi, to be listen. back. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's so nice to have you both back. Um, Michelle, you were just here when we were talking about Flood Origin a few episodes ago. But Oleg, it's been a number of years. It's been like four years years since last time you were on the show. Yeah, episode five. That's been episode a while. Five. Wow. Yeah. OG. <laughs> That's literally like 70 episodes ago. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, which is which is crazy. Oleg was such a trooper. If you haven't listened I did, to actually. the origins <laughs> of the episodes, did you? You did. I wanted to I'm like, oh, what's this guy like? I, I don't know him, but let's let's get to know him through the podcast episode. Yeah. So yeah, I was like outside hey. of Michelle's episode, it's the best episode. <laughs> <laughs> 
It was certainly one for the books. So if you haven't listened to that episode, Oleg and I met at a podcast meetup here in New York City, and I pitched the podcast to him. He decided to come on as one of my first guests, which meant Oleg coming into my house and the two of us sitting under a clothes drying rack with a bunch of blankets thrown over it. And that's how we recorded episode five in person. We have like upgraded considerably from blanket forts in the last four years. But how have you been, Oleg? What have you been up to? So since then, I think when we recorded, I think I had only read the first book of The Witcher because I think I mentioned this the last time, but Alyssa put me on The Witcher. I'd heard of it before. I knew it was like a video game. I thought actually, I thought it was called The Witcher because he killed witches. And I thought (laughs) it was like this all super dark fantasy and whatever. I ended up reading all of the books and I didn't play a lot, but each game I played at least 30 minutes. So (laughs) (laughs) you got through the onboarding and tutorials. (laughs) Yeah, basically. I mean, The Witcher 3 is is really nice. It's like a masterpiece. Yeah. I think my favorite, I don't know if the right word is content or or Michelle (laughs) uh, hooked me up with the term intellectual property. Yeah. (laughs) I think my favorite is is still the first two books of the short stories. And um, Mm. well, obviously I watched all the shows as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure we'll take a deep dive into that as well. Yeah. And Michelle, I feel like we had you on, I think about six months ago. That sounds about right. Yeah. Beginning of I the think year. it was back in January or so is when we did the recording. It must have been because Blood Origin came out on Christmas Day. So oh, yeah. somewhere around January. Sounds about right. How have yeah. you been the last few months? You know, it's been really good. It's been a lot that's been going on. So I and my boyfriend, who together we are Kowacha Studios, we screened our first feature film in LA. So we were really excited about that. And then following up on that, just last weekend, we got the announcement that our film had been accepted into the Fort Lauderdale International Film Festival. Oh, amazing. So, yeah, yeah, so that's in November. We'll see if we'll be able to go to that, depending on time and budget and whether we can take some time off for that. But yeah, so that's been a really exciting piece of news that we've had recently. Hey guys, it's like editing day before Alyssa here. Um, Michelle and I actually did get to meet for the first time in person. Uh, This episode was recorded in July of 2023, and we met up in November 2023 while she was here in the New York area. Um, And we were also joined by Kyle from the U.S., who you'll recognize from other episodes of the podcast. And yeah, it was lovely. So this actually did happen. It was great. Okay, now back to the show. Other than that, for my own independent stuff, apart from Goacha Studios, I recently, with a friend, launched a resort wear collection. Oh, sick. Yeah, thank you. So I knit the pieces. She sells them on Instagram. So it's been an adventure so far. We just launched that a couple of weeks ago. So just kind of getting into the groove of that as well. And then one of the highlights of my year was helping out with the questions and things for the uh, Peter Kenny and Doug Cockle episode. Like you did so good. (laughs) It was was just like, this is one of the things that just, I'm like, okay, I can die happy now. (laughs) Yeah. If you haven't listened to either the Peter Kenny, Doug Cockle episode, which is episode 75 or the bonus content on YouTube, that's them improvising in character as Geralt, Yen, Siri, Dandelion, so on and so forth. Michelle wrote all the scenarios for their improv scenes, as well as contributed some questions for that discussion. Absolute rock star. Oh, Doug and Peter you. had so much fun. And thank oh, you so good. much for making that possible. No, I was just like, you know, you were just like stressed out and, and there was a lot going on. <laughs> it was like your birthday coming up. And I'm just like, how can we help? And, you know, I'm just like, OK, I'll do this. And I don't know. <laughs> We'll use any of it, but we'll see what happens. And then I was just very excited to watch that episode in the bonus content. Just a surreal moment for me because I've heard these men speaking for the last several years. And I'm like, they're interacting with things that I wrote. (laughs) (laughs) It was perfect. And I can't thank you enough for all of that. No, thank you for sharing the opportunity with me. I was just just chuffed to bits, as the Brits would say. (laughs) Truly, truly. <laughs> and hopefully there's lots of that more to come. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Michelle, that's like a very heavy intro. A lot of stuff. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm jealous, you know. Oh no. I was just like looking over my bio, like, oh, I don't know if I could really no, in a brag good way, about yeah. anything. <laughs> what is resort wear? 
Oh, so this is like things that you might wear to a resort, to lounge Makes around sense. in and look cute in. Mm -hmm. You know, so we have swimsuits. I wouldn't recommend swimming in them because they are made of 100% cotton. So, you know, <laughs> at your own risk. And then also things for covering up or to be seen in while drinking something colorful is what I would market that as. All right, <laughs> I'm nice. not head of marketing on that. I'm like, <laughs> nope, I don't want to deal with the marketing. I said to my friend, like, you handle that side. I'll just make this and then, you know, we'll come together on that. But yeah, I think like drinking fruity things while looking hot is like something to aspire to. That sounds yeah. like a great, great I've time. I've never done it, <laughs> I think there's but a it big looks demand. Like fun. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I love me a virgin mango daiquiri. It's Ooh. just a smoothie and it's so good. It's okay. No one has to know there's no alcohol in it. <laughs> I like knowing there's no alcohol in it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, same. I'm not a big drinker either, honestly. <laughs> I used to be, you know, like Geralt, especially with my uh, Slavic friends, but um, yeah. not so much now. I'm like Geralt at the ball, uh, the party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, are you having a good time? Great. Mm. <laughs> and scene. <laughs> Very accurate impressions, though. Yeah. But I guess that also takes us, you know, appropriately to episode five, um, in which we are going to be talking about, like, Thanid and the ball that happens here in this episode. And we'll continue our discussion of Netflix's The Witcher Season 3 with Episode 305, The Art of Illusion, in which Yennefer and Geralt step out arm in arm and dress to kill at a lavish ball. But all is not as it seems during a night of revelry and revelations. Here's a quick synopsis of the episode. In Episode 305, The Art of Illusion, Yennefer and Geralt return to their shared room after the opening ball of the Mage's Conclave. Throughout the episode, we move between the past at the ball and the present in their room. When Geralt and Yennefer arrive at the ball, Yennefer sets the scene for him. As Yennefer approaches to say in Vilgefortz, Dijkstra interrupts Geralt and Philippa to speak with the Witcher privately. He tries to build a case for turning Ciri over to Redania. Seemingly angered by Dijkstra, Geralt leaves. Vilgefortz and Geralt witness Istrid and Yennefer having a private moment, and the sorcerer tries to undermine Geralt. Geralt asks Yennefer about Istrid, but they're interrupted by the melange. Geralt and Yennefer dance with the other sorcerers and sorceresses, holding fleeting conversations that reveal their alliances and motives. As the melange ends, Geralt and Istrid break out into a fistfight over Yennefer. When Geralt calls for a truce, the mage Artois topples over. At the end of the ball, Tissaia toasts peace among the northern mages, as well as Yennefer, for her efforts in coordinating the conclave. Yennefer and Geralt continue to make love throughout the evening. We return to the start of the ball from new perspectives. Geralt and Yen discuss the realities of confronting Stregobor at the Conclave. Philippa propositions Geralt, and also breaks the news of Codringer and Fenn's deaths. Dijkstra warns Geralt of the upcoming war against Nilfgaard, but the Witcher is distracted by Stregobor's aggressive behavior across the room and leaves the conversation abruptly. During their private conversation, Istrid and Triss tell Yen about the Book of Monoliths. Geralt and Yennefer agree to make a distraction so she can steal the book. It's revealed that Geralt and Istrid's theatrical fight was the distraction for Stregobor. Yennefer sneaks into Stregobor's office, but a magical alarm alerts him and he hurries back. In a cabinet, Yennefer finds lists of and artifacts from half-elven archers and novices. Stregobor catches Yennefer, but Geralt interrupts. Yennefer, Triss, and Geralt accuse Stregobor of kidnapping novices, experimenting on them, and attempting to kill Yennefer through a corrupted portal. Istrid finds the Book of Monoliths in the back of the cupboard. The Brotherhood elders plan to place Stregobor on trial after the Conclave. Tissaia takes the book, and the rest return to the ball. Yennefer picks up Tissaia's forgotten jewelry. After Tissaia's toast, Geralt tells Yen, I love you for the first time. Back in their room, Yennefer shares that she can't get Philippa out of her head. The sorceress had tried to convince Yennefer to join her side and leave the Brotherhood behind. Conversely, Vilgefortz tried to coerce the Witcher into joining his side of the upcoming battle, but the Witcher rejected him. As morning breaks, Geralt and Yennefer start to put the pieces together— the Scarlet Amamite from Tissaia and Lydia's jewelry can be found in the mines of West Rodania, where Geralt discovered the mutated novices. Lydia is in love with Vilgefortz, and the corrupt portal took Yennefer to the site of the first landing, the subject of Vilgefortz's favorite painting. They suddenly realize Vilgefortz, not Stregobor, is their real target. Geralt leaves the room as violent shouts are heard across Aratuza. Geralt's ambushed by Dijkstra, who puts a knife to the witcher's throat, claiming he should have chosen a side. So now that we've gotten a synopsis on episode 305 from future Alyssa, what were some of your thoughts on the episode, the plot, acting, costumes, 
anything that you guys want to throw out before we get into our discussion questions? I guess just first reaction, uh, whether it was in the book or the episode, was like, this place is so not Geralt, you know, like uh, <laughs> <laughs> the clothes, the observed kind of uh, fakery, the decorum mm -hmm. of just being very fake and being like poisonous to each other without the physicality of, you know, just fighting or something. <laughs> Just like a lack of good solid food and, and all these rules to prevent you from actually enjoying the party, which it's very like paradoxical when you're at a party to enjoy yourself. You know, you can't eat your fill. You can't get drunk, be comfortable. There's no good music. So I was thinking the whole time, like, I bet he wishes he could be in one of those taverns that they show him, you know, like meeting up with good old, you know, Yarp and Zigrin or someone around and <laughs> somebody laying under the table and just like beer. How about sloshing around Gwent? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Try not to mention the book too much, but in the book, it seemed like he was really not in the series too. He seemed like he really didn't want to be there. But in the book, he seemed to really be doing it for Yennefer. I think in the mm -hmm. series, he was a little more like, okay, we need to do this to gather info and protect Siri. And I think in the book, he was more like, it was like that theme of, um, these are the things we do for, I guess, people we love or who mean something to yeah. us. Like we get dressed in uncomfortable outfits and go to these ridiculous events. <laughs> Absolutely. I think like that's one of the delights when we get to Thanid in the book series. And I feel like the difference in the show is that it's obviously masked in even more politics and intrigue because we're seeing it from every side um, with this ensemble cast. Mm -hmm. Michelle, what did you think of the episode? My initial thoughts were, this is a perfect representation of what it's like to go to a party where you don't know anybody and <laughs> you sort of rehash it later with the person you came with. Like, okay, so what did this person say? Wait, what? No, what exactly did they say? Yeah. And there's just all this sort of, hi, how are you? How's it going? Oh my God, I love your outfit. And you're like, she's such a bitch. So like, <laughs> you know, just that kind of backbiting, sniping, fake smiles, all of that. I was just like, yep, this is how it feels sometimes. You know, and you just sort of are in Yennefer's and Geralt's position where you're just yeah. like, okay, I have to be here. I have to put on appearances. I have to show my face here. And even if you don't really want to be there, you're like, all right, let me just find something I can enjoy about this. And maybe get a little dirt on the on the people that I'm talking to yeah for whatever reason you might need that for but just how there's so many layers of information and perception we see it one way and mm -hmm. it turns out to be something else <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I'm so excited to dig into that part of the production, too, as we get into our discussion. There's, as far as, like, certain parts of the production go, things like costumes, lighting, all that stuff, it was very moody. I think it was, mm -hmm. like, moody in an appropriate way, I think, for the way that the episode takes place and the context in which it is sitting in with the builds up from the rest of part one. So... That part was was very enjoyable. Like, I enjoyed the costumes. I would have loved to see them just, like, pushed even further, even further. I think my, like, fantasy for Thanid was, like, every single dress I yeah. like that's gravity-defying, seeing things in, like, all sorts of weird shapes and sizes and just mm -hmm. getting really unconventional. I think that was my fantasy for Thanid. So mm -hmm. I still, like, it was beautiful. But it was like beautiful realism. And I would have loved to just, for the sake of what this ridiculousness is, I would have just yeah. loved to see that just be absolutely extra yeah. and like way too much. Um, but there were cute details. Like Philippa's dress looked like an owl it on the did. torso, which was very cute. Yeah, I thought Geralt, like, it actually looked pretty comfortable what he was wearing. Because that's a big thing, how he's very uncomfortable in the clothes in the series. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's not bad and he's then, so um, uncomfortable though it's a little itchy i guess <laughs> <laughs> he's always complaining about his doublet yeah yeah the doublet yeah i wonder what have happened if like it was so tight that when he went to like punch a shred like one of the sleeves ripped or something Maybe. like that just for how uncomfy it was that might have been like a nice little thing yeah and like in the again comparison to the book but in the, in the book you know it's all the sorcerers they're described as being dressed so like, very revealing, <laughs> very yeah, provocative, <laughs> very scantily, provocative. Yeah. right? And yeah. then, I'm, but like in the series, I'm like, oh, that that's actually more conservative than most of the time you see like people in a line outside like a club or a bar kind of. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was like very red carpet where the Netflix show went, which I think again like isn't like out of bounds yeah. for production in general. Yeah, red carpet's a good way to put it. 
it's probably a lot easier to like borrow actual designer pieces that yeah. already exist that happen to fit the actors and then you know use them for filming or rent them and then return them later I can imagine the costume budget would have been a, a lot if they had to sort of custom make all these pieces for Thanid but something I, I kind of thought for Yennefer's costume was like yeah it's at first it looks a little bit more subdued a little simpler but a couple of things one I think at this point where where she is in the season she's basically coming back to Aretusa to kind of grovel and Mm -hmm. try to get back into the good graces of the brotherhood and if she is dressed in an ostentatious way then people are going to be like oh well look at her she's a show-off and she doesn't look very apologetic you know what's she wearing kind of thing but if she's a little bit less showy than the rest of the mages then they might be like okay well she looks contrite enough she looks sad and yeah looking for forgiveness but also just like the little halter top and skirt combined with her braid i think might be a kind of subtle nod to um anya chalotra's indian heritage as well mm-hmm. i believe the designer or anya herself have mentioned that as well which is a nice little touch yeah it's a nice little little extra thing yeah I mean, in terms of the Easter eggs, you know, we've been kind of dancing around the books in comparisons to the books. For the most part, I feel like episode five pulls a lot of direct story beats from this chapter in Time of Contempt. I believe it's chapter three of Time of Contempt. So everything from the interaction with Sabrina, Mm -hmm. Geralt's conversations with Vilgefort and Dijkstra, Mm -hmm. the I love you between Yennefer and Geralt, although it's much stupider in the books. Like, it's very sincere. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) It's very sincere on screen and like comes toward like a third of the way through the episode it's like a climactic point they say love you you've got like the macro zoom on their faces but in the books Geralt when Yennefer says I love you back Geralt chokes on a prawn and she has to tell him like put your arms up put your arms up and I'll clap you on the back you're gonna be okay and it's just very very silly in the books so that was that was a little difference and then obviously toward the end of the episode Geralt and Dijkstra meeting the morning after we'll get well and then that's where the episode cuts <laughs> off but for the most part like it's it's hard to talk about like easter eggs when the majority or a lot of story beats in this episode are really pulled straight from the books mm-hmm. even i was reading the chapter this morning even kira's little comment of like oh i'm not drinking because i want to get pregnant tonight yeah. like that was an excerpt from the books right. as well so a lot of things and then of course Geralt and Istrid's fight everybody kind of sees that as being a reflection of shard of ice yeah, yeah. Did you guys happen to find any more? Well, even just like the caviar being an illusion, I think Mm. it's Philippa who points that out in the episode. And I'm like, oh, what? Yeah. And she actually makes the illusion caviar in the books. Yeah. Which is very funny. Maybe she does in the show, but we just don't hear about it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I actually, I read the chapter before this and this chapter, like very shortly before we were recording. So um, excuse if I uh, (laughs) confuse them, but I remember just seeing almost like, I guess the negative part when I was watching it, it was almost like notes. I was waiting for it to hit. Mm. But yeah, in the chapter, I guess it's a lot more ingrained in what's going on. Or maybe that's just the perception when you read it and then you watch it. And then when you watch it, it almost seemed like as if it's almost purposely inserted Easter eggs. Like I remember the whole thing with the caviar. It's like a whole scene in the books. But here they fire off like three things from the book at once. I remember she's like, oh, there's aphrodisiac in the wine. Mm-hmm. And actually, I think Geralt says it as a, as a joke in the book, but she's like, who did it? Uh, Marty. Marty. Yeah, Marty, Marty. put an effort yeah. like in the wine. And also that caviar is an illusion and also like, I think something else. So she just kind of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely recognize those right away. And uh, one thing that I'm not sure if I missed something or not, because Yen, in the series, she says something about it's their first night out together. Mm-hmm. And all she can think of is getting him alone. But I think even in the episode, she had mentioned the different parties or occasions they've been to together. So I didn't quite. uh... Yeah, I think she mentions a list of their nights together in episode one. She talks in Sherwood. She mentions like, oh, yeah, the time in Rind, the time in. But I think that's all the memorable times they have slept together. Mm. I think when she talks about like this is our first time out, I assume it's like their first time out in society as a couple because they were they had met at uh yennefer's little orgy in rind but they weren't a couple at that point and then i think she was also mentioning you know your little 
thing in Sintra as an allusion to when you know he's out with Yaskir at Kalanthi's uh, little marriage proposal wedding thing for Pavetta. So it's I think it's just like she had heard about this either from Yaskir's little songs or from just people talking. But this is really like their first time out in public as a couple where people can be like, oh, they're an item. Let's talk about that. Yeah. And people definitely do. I actually just checked in the beginning, of, even of the chapter, and I realized that I think I misread it. That, yeah, it's exactly as you said. Even it says, like, previously when they lived together and things were good between them, and Yennefer had wanted to attend assemblies and conclaves with him at her side, at that time he steadfastly refused. So maybe this is the first time he didn't refuse. Yeah. Yeah. I think if you keep reading the passage in the book, it's even like she asked him again, and he immediately said yes this time. Aww. Yeah. Just sweet. He's He's a sweet boy when he wants to be. Yeah. (laughs) But there's a lot I think that book readers will enjoy from this episode as we've spoken about or that'll be just intimately familiar to them, which I think is very fun. And as we kind of get into the episode discussion and our discussion questions, I want to turn over to some of the production elements and the editing specifically of this episode. So how would you guys say the nonlinear editing of episode five helped shape the viewer's understanding of the plot in this episode? So I would say that first we have the superficial layer, maybe what everyone around them perceives, right? We see Mm -hmm. them having issues. They're not really connecting. You see them dancing. You see them maybe get a little bit fluttered or twitterpated on the dance floor and then a fight breaks out and then we see Tseya sort of thanking them and then we get another layer of information back with the previous one we see like Vilgefort's kind of egging on Geralt like you never forget your first love do you yeah and you see seemingly Geralt getting upset by that and be like well if you excuse me immediately confronts Yennefer second is like Geralt's perception of things, maybe a bit of Yennefer's perception of things, of how it happened. We get more information. Oh, they're actually sort of conspiring to get information. And this is a ruse. Mm -hmm. And then we get a third level of information of like Geralt's interpretation of Yennefer's perception with Philippa Eilhart. And also Mm -hmm. we get more information from the Vilgefort's conversation earlier with Geralt. And there's that information. Then after the party, we have, oh, wait, This has been a a reverse Knives Out episode where we have all these pieces (laughs) of information coming out, but they got to the wrong conclusion because of their own biases. Mm -hmm. So shoot, now what are we going to do? I personally really enjoyed it. And it's all just through editing, the writing, the storytelling. And it did kind of remind me a little bit of some of the kind of nonlinear storytelling devices from season one, Mm -hmm. but all in one episode. Right. What about you, Oleg? I like how they use, I guess, the jumping around. I think in season one, people mentioned it was pretty confusing for them. Here, it was like just very obvious, meaning like it's uh, easy to follow. And actually, thanks, Michelle, for clearing that up, because a question I had was first, I've seen where, you know, that device is used to switch between different points of view. So I was like, wait, are they switching between Geralt and Yennefer? But they weren't, right? And then I realized it really is like almost like, rather layers and honing in on different details which Mm -hmm. they focus on each time they discuss yeah i like how they use that device because i remember in the book just the last part i think his encounter with vilgefortz they do that with but here they do the whole chapter yeah yennefer and Geralt's scenes after the party almost serve as a framing narrative for the rest of the story so it's i think the assumption is that I guess it's Geralt telling his side, Yennefer telling her side, and the audience seeing and hearing that in a number of different iterations. So as Michelle said, the first time we only get little bits here and there of almost like a third person's understanding of the ball as if we were there, but only, you know, seeing Geralt's in this corner and then seeing somebody else in there and then glancing down with Vilgefortz and seeing Yennefer and Istrid. But as you said, we continue to get new layers and new information. I think the nonlinear storytelling helps in a few different ways, just because one, it adds to the mystery and the political intrigue that we've been getting over the last four episodes. So I feel like, again, as with the overall mood and the ambience of Thanid, just the editing alone 
adds to that curiosity and to that mystery for viewers. Mm -hmm. Um, So we are slowly unpacking the layers of this event as the characters do themselves, which makes it more interesting, in my opinion. Definitely. And they also do their best, I think, in this episode to just continually put markers so we can mentally realign every time we kind of get this story from end to end. So, for example, like Valdo Marx's song, All Is Not As It Seems, Mm -hmm. which... You know, the lyrics are a little bit of overkill. Yeah, but it's supposed to be funny, you know? Just, yeah. It's, it's, it's on the nose. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very on the nose. They know that, and they're just having fun. And yeah, we're like, hey, guys, have fun with this. We know that we're yeah. being really obvious, but... And cheesy, yeah. And but it, enjoy. <laughs> yeah, and it is... When we first met Valdemarx in the last episode, um, I know that the character is polarizing, because I know for some people, like, the modernization of that character pulls them out. And for me, I found it hilarious. And in my yeah. opinion, it was very sakovsky like just yeah. because it was so meta <laughs> and just so modern that I was like, this feels like parts of the books in which, like, it's overly meta or Mm -hmm. overly modern just input into this fantasy setting oh yeah and it's ridiculous as is a lot of Sakovsky's writing yeah so I thought it was entertaining um and he's still the only character to almost break the fourth wall yeah and (laughs) he does that like little spin and looks directly into camera in the beginning of the episode and so it again feels very self-referential which is very fun yeah yeah I was like what what is this a musical now like I I I had that at one moment (laughs) as soon as Waldo Marx comes on screen in the previous episode my boyfriend was like oh no Joey Beatty invited all of his theater friends from (laughs) drama drama school and now they're all on screen together i'm like yep you know it i love it (laughs) that's so cute yeah yeah Yeah, seeing especially like the whole thing about um like the rivalry with yaskir you know and then like Mm -hmm. it's in my mind when i saw them at the um party it's like ah fuck these guys you know yaskir all the way I know. It's definitely like one of those things. I do appreciate having them there and they're very fun and very silly. You got to give it up for Yaskier. And right now he's, that man is getting laid. Good for him. (laughs) Having fun in the woods. Like he hasn't been getting laid the entire series. (laughs) Yo, facts though. Facts. (laughs) As it is with his character. Oh yeah. But I think that the editing is really interesting in general for this episode, as we've already called out. But we also see it in a very specific way in which book readers, as we said, will be very familiar with Istrid and Geralt's rivalry in the short story A Shard of Ice. And while in Sword of Destiny, we see Geralt and Istrid's rivalry play out over Yennefer, at this stage of the show, we aren't really at that level of like dueling for her affection. And we obviously see that play out where their fight is just kind of a mock fight to be used as a distraction and they play along to the best of their abilities. What do you think of this change to their relationship on screen? And how do you guys predict future seasons will handle their interactions going forward? I feel like this is also with the assumption, though, that Istrid makes it out of Thanet. <laughs> yeah, but we'll have to see, I guess. You know, yeah. <laughs> will he make it out? Who knows? But um, this might be kind of a nod to the costumes again and hair and makeup. But I feel like maybe his drastic change in hairstyle might have been a way to kind of set up the believability of this. Because you're like, oh, come on. It's basically copying Geralt's hair now. Like, is he trying to? <laughs> be another Geralt for Yennefer and win her back. Like, but my hair's better than his. It's curlier, <laughs> more luscious. So I condition mine. But yeah, like I think it's an interesting change. It sort of speaks to their mutual maturity at this point. They're like, well, you know, let the lady decide for herself. And I think Geralt's man enough to be like, well, you know, that was then, this is now. And Istrid mm-hmm. is like, well, there's only been Yen and my books. And right now the books are what I care about the most. I feel like Triss, like in the last episode, in this episode might be a love interest. Like I, I'm it getting like be. possible love interest vibes. Yeah. I, I feel I like in the book, so. they really leaned into the Triss and like Yennefer being very jealous. And she was just a lot mm-hmm. more, I think, jealous there. But here, I almost feel like they didn't even hint at, well, actually during the dance somewhat, I guess. Yeah, during the dance, I think they had a minimal interaction, but in the previous episode, Yennefer seemed very sincerely thankful to Triss Mm -hmm. for her help with Ciri, while also at the same time acknowledging that Triss could only help so much, therefore it is my responsibility. I don't think that there's true animosity in that relationship no, or rivalry, but it does seem that, like, show Triss 
has some insecurity about like her ability or inability to help Siri, and now it's manifesting in her wanting to get to the bottom of this mystery with Istrid. Right. So it's slightly different. But yeah, in regards to Geralt and Istrid, I actually quite like the path that the show has set out for Istrid in that he's his own little archaeologist yeah. throughout seasons one and two. He's dabbling on his own, tinkering his little sandbox, and then comes back to like continue tinkering. And I think that like this is an appropriate thing to give him to do. Right. He's been, you know... <laughs> He's been like in his little monolith corner for the last two seasons. And so I think it's appropriate for his character to be the one that Triss goes to with this information. And he's the one to investigate all of this. So I feel like at this point, it's like you're saying, like romance is the bottom of Geralt and Istrid's worries at the moment. Right. Istrid wants to find nirvana doblathana for the elves or ship them off to another continent or whatever Mm -hmm. and he also wants to get to the bottom of this mystery with Triss. Geralt is very preoccupied about Ciri's safety and who this mysterious mage is so I feel like for the moment their current preoccupations are not each other and so they can work together. Right. Yeah, Istra definitely seems more into like books and studying. He was in Nilfgaard for a while, right? I think in the beginning of the show. Mm -hmm. I even forgot about their whole like beef from the shortest stories until you mentioned that <laughs> I was like oh that's the guy because yeah I imagined like an older like more like a seasoned sorcerer but for me Istrid looks like a not a kid but like a young guy and I don't know I didn't like take him as seriously and I'm like yeah you know but um yeah it seems like here they're almost they're both just playing it up without anything like backing the actual like the whole ruse they put up of having this mm-hmm beef over Yennefer. Yeah. Yeah. And back to production standpoint, when you're looking to adapt a work and you see that there is some rivalry or some drama or some issues that might be interesting to viewers, what we often look for is how can we play up existing drama? Mm -hmm. If there isn't any, how can we maybe add some? And if there is no mystery or problem for the audience to solve with the characters, what can we do to kind of nudge the plot along those lines? So in season two, we have Geralt looking for, why is this fleshy coming out of seemingly nowhere? How did this affect Eskel? And what does this have to do with Siri, if anything? And then in season three, we have this extra mystery of Rance and the girls in the weird human centipede cavern. Um, I hate it. I- <laughs> That was a scary ass monster. That was creepy. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, ooh, this is getting really gross. <laughs> were the heads of the girls trying to manipulate Geralt or were they actually sincerely asking him for help? I think, I think it's they were both. sincerely asking for help. Yeah. I don't think they had any control of their bodies, but no. I think they could feel it. Like, I don't think they were able to control no. the creature. No. But every time he stabbed one and one of them died, oh, yeah. it's awful. Yeah. 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 So we have that. They were just kind of hang like a snot. Yeah. I'm just like, (laughs) no, no, no. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see if anything happens with that in next episodes or the next season. Yeah. But yeah. So with this mystery that now we have Tris and Istrid to solve and also Tristan, 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 yeah, (laughs) Tristan. Tristan and Gennifer <laughs> are solving <laughs> their mysteries together now. They're sort of working together separately mm-hmm. to solve them. And it also helps with the audience maintain their involvement and be like, oh, let me see if I can piece these together as well. So now it feels mm-hmm. like there's more involvement only for the characters from the books that now have something more to do, but also for the people who are viewing at home. Yeah. Now that I think back on it, I think they are setting up a Tris and istrid thing because if you remember especially when she meets him in the library and she's kind of very like close to him like reaching right past him that kind of thing i think uh, maybe they're doing something it's cute yeah yeah it's the kind of thing that like with characters that we only see very briefly in the books that Mm -hmm. they've extended or new show characters i said this on previous podcast episodes every single episode i'm like oh my god are they gonna die because we (laughs) don't have like in the books obviously like we only have stregobor for one short story we only have istrid for one short story dara is not a book character so who knows what's gonna happen to him and when and it's one of those things i'm just like is Istrid gonna make it on thanet is Istrid gonna make it on thanet i don't 
know. But if he does, like, I feel the work that they've done over the last few seasons makes me invested in him as a character. I think that in addition to my personal investment in his storyline, he's really the only character who is investigating the monolith part of the storyline that they've Mm -hmm. added yeah so i do think it'd be nice to like keep him around to continue that or if he didn't make it out of thanet would they have another character take up that mantle i'm not sure how they would continue to push the story forward without a character who themselves invested in that specific mystery right so i'm super curious to see but he's one of those characters that i'm just like he's not in the books so when's he going to die? <laughs> oh, no. That's a good point. No, I, I, I would love to keep him around, I want to keep him around, too. Yeah. Because, yeah, he was kind of a jerk in season one. But I feel like he's kind of redeeming himself by growing up a bit. And who doesn't like a moody archaeologist that hangs around libraries all the time? <laughs> but I think he's used almost like as a, I don't know if the right word is like exposition. He's giving us like mm. info about like the mystery the whole time that they wouldn't otherwise be able to convey to us. So maybe they do need him around until they don't. Yeah, we'll <laughs> see. I have a feeling the monoliths aren't going to be going anywhere for quite a while. In fact, we might ramp up the monoliths a bit more in future seasons due to plot developments. But that's just my guess, but we'll see what happens. I don't know if we're going to see more Geralt Istrid rivalry, like, no, Yennefer's mine. It's Yen, not Yenna, Yen, Yenna kind of thing that we yeah. saw earlier. <laughs> but, you know, maybe their their rivalry will play out in more subtle ways, or maybe they'll just get rid of it altogether. We'll see. Mm. He'll be like, come on, you got Triss. Like, and he'll be like, all right, true, or whatever, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs> yeah. Also, it's nice to see Triss have something more to do than the very little amount of time we see her in the books Mm because it's not very glamorous the stuff we do see her get up to in some of the books descriptions of her no (laughs) so i'm glad she gets to be a bit more dignified in this season yeah i mean the last time that we saw tris in the books she was in the woods shitting herself like (laughs) confessing her one-sided love to Geralt, and it's like girl do better you can be better you deserve better Mm -hmm. why is this happening to you please don't yeah i think like for me i found tris to be like the only mage slash whatever sorcerer person that was like the only humble one you know (laughs) so i like tris always from the books and and the the series too so that would be nice if they give her more um kind of stand up for herself and all that Mm mm-hmm Yeah, definitely very interested in both her and Isterit and how their storylines will move forward in the future. Throughout this episode as well, Geralt is kind of continually bombarded with questions, requests, proposals that directly contrast with his neutrality. And to what extent do you believe Geralt is as neutral as he claims or he wants to be? Even like back in reading the books, I remember the whole thing was, I think, as a witcher, right? A part of being a witcher. It's kind of like in Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones, you have like the Night's Watch, right? Their job is just to protect the realm and fight off the monsters, but otherwise they're neutral to politics and all of that. And and that's what I thought witches were supposed to be. And he's always talking about neutrality, but I feel like he's constantly either taking sides and then eventually he's just getting caught up into the whole thing. And I think just the whole interest, the part about neutrality it's just an interesting like discussion it might even be one of the key things for me in the episode and chapter, you know, like neutrality mm-hmm. is shown as this like good thing, but I've actually spoken to people, especially like right now in the context of like Russia, Ukraine war and everything like is pacifism always the moral stance or sometimes do you need to stand up to somebody, right? Like, for example, people standing aside during like the pogroms, either in the story or, you know, like the Holocaust and the Jews and, and all of that, or like the European countries being neutral but then eventually needed to stop hitler and even just among like the eastern european community there's a lot of times a debate among modern russians is it better to try to stand up to the government or do you stay out of it because you have this whole history where they're always running over you so it's better to adapt as gerald says you know and he he talks about neutrality but i feel like he's anything but neutral you know what i mean Mm mm-hmm Yeah, Geralt's interesting just because I feel like his neutrality is something that he himself believes with conviction. He Mm -hmm. believes that he needs to be neutral in order to work 
as an independent contractor for kings, for mages, for anybody who will give him coin. And that's the way that we see Geralt, especially toward the earlier episodes, the earlier books, that sort of thing. And I feel like all of that changes when he's no longer alone. Yes. When Ciri's in the picture, when Yen's in the picture, when Yaskir's in the picture, he will not change his neutrality, but intervene to protect people that he loves. And I think in a political minefield as this ball, everybody's coming up to him with, yeah, proposals or trying to get him on their side. And he has very little interest in being on anyone's political side if it's not about protecting Siri. But we end the episode, of course, with Dijkstra coming out of the dark and being like, you should have picked a side and then cut to black. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. I feel like this is kind of reflecting Geralt's arc in season one, where he starts off as very adamantly neutral until he is forced into a corner and a side has already been picked for him. And then he spends the rest of the season regretting that and being haunted by that until he decides, you know what, I can't be neutral in this situation because I have someone who's depending on me. So mm -hmm. it's unclear at this point whether he is truly asserting his neutrality at Thanid in order to throw everyone off or because he sincerely deeply believes that he is because he doesn't want to harm Siri. But is he saying he's neutral to everyone because he's trying to keep his cards close to the chest or is he is he genuinely just like, nope, no sides, no sides. I could be from the Northern yeah. Kingdoms. I could be from Nilfgaard. I don't care. I'm neutral. But I feel like because of his emotional involvement with the people he's grown close to over the last three seasons, he just by definition is no longer neutral because they're involved in greater political schemes. And now because mm -hmm. he cares about them and because he is going to defend them, it's just not an option for him to not get involved anymore at this point. I think he's just probably trying to be like, nope, I'm neutral until the last second. Yeah. I think he's almost like saying it to convince himself, you know, where people are like, no, don't mm -hmm. worry, everything's cool. But that person is just saying for themselves, like, he's just like, yeah, neutral, like, come on. You know? yeah. But like, yeah, people wouldn't be asking him for all these like favors and giving him these proposals if he didn't already, I guess, either knowingly or unknowingly make himself a figure that is like known and people want something from like if he was just a neutral witcher like people would be like okay who cares like they wouldn't pay attention mm -hmm. to him but i think that the whole siri thing probably set it off but even and not to jump to the strike board thing but like even with renfrey right he, he would still always in most of the short stories even he would choose he would do something maybe other than what a like a neutral by the code witcher would do mm -hmm. and i, I kind of miss that because it's like a simple time you have the witcher he has his neutral code and he just goes on these adventures and does this stuff but i think that's what almost sweeps him into the main story is him parting with neutrality do you, i don't know if you guys yeah mm -hmm. feel that way i would agree like i think it's interesting because it's something that he both advocates for and obviously struggles with yeah to bring it back to <laughs> so for example i'm familiar with like marcus aurelius and like meditations and stuff like that and if you don't know the context that this is a man who's probably writing notes to himself because he's struggling with mm -hmm. certain things, mm -hmm. it makes it feel more, not biblical, but like, it feels like Moses tablets of just being <laughs> like, you have to do these things, where it's more like, no, I'm struggling with thinking about the dichotomy of control. Therefore, I need to write about what it means to me. And like, this is something that I have issue with. And this is how I want to perceive myself and the world around me. Whereas I think for Geralt, it's interesting because it's clearly a value to him because he's trying to instill it in Siri. Mm -hmm. We see this in episode one, Sherawed. We see this in previous seasons when he talks about Siri and Rince or when he talks about Siri and the Black Knight and her aspirations to kill this guy. And he's just like slow down <laughs> maybe maybe think about this for a hot second yeah but I feel like it's definitely something that he values because he's trying to instill it in his adoptive daughter mm -hmm. whether or not he's able to live it himself is I think an entirely different question absolutely maybe the positive impact of it on him and those around him is that at least that little bit of trying for neutrality might taper the passion for a cause and so you know the whole thing about like when fighting monsters don't become one of the monsters. And I think when mm -hmm. people get too passionate about a cause that can often 
fog their brain and make them go too far, do too many things. And maybe having an element of, I mean, he can call it neutrality, but like just not so strongly siding with one side, you can also take into account maybe the wisdom or correctness of the other side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's also just like a political minefield at this point of the continent's story. So as a survival technique or defense mechanism, it's like, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to swear fealty to one or the other? And if they lose, like, it's not a sin that the continent is going to forgive easily mm -hmm. if he swears loyalty to Redania and Nilfgaard comes in and swoops in. They'll be like, aha, you, you are a traitor to the great white flame over here like <laughs> off with his head or does he try to sort of straddle both worlds and then you can have still work and survive from both sides when the conflict boils over eventually well i think it's also interesting in the context of the show especially just because again they play up the politics and they play up the mystery and the violence and so is it easier for him to be neutral when everybody's a suspected enemy too. So he knows that Dijkstra is after him, but also wants something. Mm -hmm. Vilgefortz is also a threat, but also wants something. And if everybody is a perceived threat, I think it's very easy to say, I need to be neutral yeah, just to protect myself and others, because I don't know where the snake in the grass is. Yeah. So I think that that's another layer to that for him. There's always Kaer Morin. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Adding to what Michelle and Alyssa, I think both of you guys made some great points, which made me think about maybe the neutrality is almost like not so much as not going with one side or another somewhat. It's more like he doesn't want to just back someone's like straight up agenda because it's not like there's like these sides and they're all trying to like for the greater good. It's from how it's presented. It almost seems like it's pretty very like ego driven, selfish, destructive agendas. And he doesn't want part of that at the very least. Yeah, I think that would be a safe assumption of his character as well, that he cares very little to boost, you know, individuals for their own gain, whether that's political or just straight power. Um, so I think that's pretty accurate to just Geralt's characterization as a whole. I'd love to continue the conversation about where the mystery ends up and like where Geralt's neutrality brings him. And as we look into uh, how this episode ends, what purpose would you say Stregobor serves as a red herring for viewers as well as our main characters? And do you think it was obvious to viewers that Vilgefortz has been the traitor this whole time? I think there's been hints of Vilgefortz's treachery, not as obviously as, you know, Stregobor. Obviously, we've seen Stregobor take very extreme views against the elves and he advocates for extermination of them the whole point of his rivalry with yennefer is because she's quarter elf right mm -hmm. so it's just like oh well you can't trust their kind remember falca that's the whole thing behind his motivations of going after these elven apprentices at artuza and we think oh well he's committed war crimes against elves he's been involved in experimenting on young women before so makes sense stregobor's our man but mm -hmm. they did not look at it with neutrality did they yeah so i think we see some hints of vilgefortz's big badness in season one where he is getting like really personal with here it's like what are what are you doing mm -hmm. why are you doing this are you hiding something maybe are you showing some cruelty that's there that might be a red flag later on? And then just for me, the fact that he was so quick to claim victory, like, oh, yes, I I am the savior of Sodden. Mm -hmm. Yep, that was all me. Yennefer mm -hmm. didn't do anything. She's the traitor. That, I think, was very sneaky and not great. But mm -hmm. to the average viewer watching, I'm not sure if it was completely obvious. Yeah. Yeah, actually, that was like a, one of the questions I had because I was like, wait, I, to me, it was really obvious that Villegafortz was a traitor all along and he's shown pretty powerful. So I was like, he's probably the link. And then I was like, wait, was it obvious? Because I, I do remember in the series, again, I, I do have some bleed over from the book and the series. So I don't mm -hmm. remember exactly where I know what from. I remember seeing him in the Battle of 
sodden and i'm pretty sure seeing him being kind of shady other times i remember i was even like why is to say like shacking up with him he's shown to be not trustworthy i thought but i'm not quite sure <laughs> again oh yeah phil Gaffords is interesting just because Obviously, book readers know now, show audiences know that he is one of the big bads of the Witcher series. And we find this out at the end of the episode with Geralt and Yen. But it's one of those things that, like, it's hard for me to even be able to tell because I know the books. I am having show only, (laughs) a few show only people on after you guys. Mm -hmm. So we'll be able to talk about like, was this actually effective? And did they know about any of this stuff about the Vilgeforts or was Stregobor incredibly effective as a diversion for this episode? Yeah, with Stregobor, I didn't really even get, I guess, why, why does Geralt hate him so much, especially as Geralt seems to be pretty smart. Like I remember there was the Renfrey thing, but. Yeah, I think it's a combination of a few things. Obviously, Geralt's personal relationship to Stregobor, you see that they still have tension, like Stregobor greets him as Butcher, Mm -hmm. like Butcher of Blaviken. Which he helped getting for Geralt the, the moniker. Oh, you just butchered these people, you, because you weren't on my side. So yeah. I've spread that around. So it's one of those things that, like, I think the duplicity of his interaction with Stregobor all the way back in episode one, but also just the way that Renfrey has shaped Geralt's journey, especially in the show. Um, he still carries around her brooch on his sword. That's been carried through since season one, episode one. And I think it's unsurprising that for them to meet again all these years later, the animosity is still there, coupled on top of the belief that now Stregobor is believed to be responsible for terrorizing Siri and terrorizing all these young women in pursuit of Siri. I think that just adds fuel to the fire because not only was it a feud that they've had for many years, but now it's suddenly incredibly, incredibly personal and timely to Geralt's experiences and his loved ones. Um, so I think that that's a huge part of it. Yeah, not to mention Stregobor has been actively harming and trying to get Yen, mm. who, even though Geralt's still kind of mad at her from what happened in season two, like, hey, don't mess with the people I care about. And also, I don't know if this is explicitly part of Geralt's MO at this point, but Stregobor's man did rape Renfrey, which was unnecessary, one, two, incredibly violent. So it's like, okay, well, this guy is willing to do anything in order to get what he wants, which goes against Geralt's credo of neutrality. And, you know, he says he doesn't judge Stregobor, but can he maintain that throughout everything that he knows about this guy and the fact that he's trying to harm those that Geralt cares about the most? I don't think so. Yeah. So and unfortunately... You know, I think they did a pretty good job of setting him up as the main series villain until suddenly he's not. And, right. you know, we feel with Geralt like, oh, my God, he's such an asshole. But you when we want to hate him, we want to hate him. And we do hate him because of everything he's done against Yennefer, Renfrey, Geralt at this point. And mm-hmm. we think, OK, well, he's got to be it. Yeah. But he's not. It is interesting, though, because he has a level of cartoonish violence to him. Like, he's very open about the fact that he's trying to just, like, annihilate elves and pardals off the continent in, right. like, a genocidal way. And, like, this is, it's just like, why are you open about this yeah. and bragging about this? And this is your personal agenda, like, openly? Like, what? What? Yeah. But it does have, like, a cartoonish element to it, whereas Vilgefortz is insidious, secretive, And much more sinister, which I think, again, like when you think about the revelation, like it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And when you think about the dupe of Vilgefort's framing, Stregobor, I assume, because Stregobor doesn't know the book, the Bonoliths is back there, Mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. It just makes the whole thing, I think, even more sinister on Vilgefort's part. Mm -hmm. The whole thing with stealing that book and then the rosters with the names and the disappearing novices um, with elven blood, were those just planted in his room by Vilgefortz? It's hard to say because it's the kind of thing that we assume by the end of the episode that Vilgefortz is the one that was experimenting on the girls, but 
when Yen kind of uses some sort of magic to look at the memory of the items, it's clearly Shregabor in the voiceover of just like, ah, give me that. So it's hard to say, like, what the timeline of events is, whether Shregabor was just antagonizing those girls with that list and Vilgefortz knew that, therefore he picked those girls specifically, or if Shregabor was part of it somehow and... It's really unclear. Yeah, I think it's more of the former where Vilgefortz is sort of using Stregobor as a resource to be like, okay, well, you know what? You found all these girls of elven heritage. Thank you for doing that for me. And now it makes it easier to uh, point out Stregobor as the villain and sort of lead all this evidence up in his wake rather than just letting things unfold naturally. So you kind of used what Stregobor was doing anyway and then added more to it. I think so, yeah. Because it's funny when they catch Stregobor, he's not like, oh, this shit isn't mine. He's just like, well, yeah, fuck elves. I hate him. And I'm like, why Why is he incriminating him? He just sounds more guilty. And yeah. I guess I might have forgot some of the details from before. Like you said that he had somebody who was after Renfrey also rape her and whatever. I guess like for me, for some reason, I kept thinking he was like in the series supposed to be like the leader of the Brotherhood. I don't know because he looks older and always serious. And also because... Yeah. um. He reminded me just of that, you know, I guess that archetype of like, you know, the racist grandpa at the dinner table kind of guy where everyone's like, yeah, what you're saying is kind of hateful, but like you're not doing any hateful actions. So just like here, eat some more food and just chill out, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, I didn't realize he was actually behind a lot of actions, you know. Yeah, I think also it's it's kind of an interesting little message, if you want to call it that or implication where it's not always the people who are just bombastically racist that you have to watch out for it's the people who are cunning sneaky about Mm -hmm. it where okay yeah you want to hate the racist grandpa it's not good to be racist don't be racist grandpa but what about your uncle who is you know making little subtle jokes that you're like oh it's just a joke well is it Right. Meanwhile, he has a roster of your friends. I know. Meanwhile, yeah, he has a right. roster of all of your <laughs> all of your friends who are not really white and are just yeah. like terrorizing just hiding it under grandpa's pillow. <laughs> <laughs> what? This isn't mine, but I wish it was. <laughs> oh no! If it wasn't for them pesky kids. <laughs> oh darn kids! I mean, it's regrettably accurate to like what we see with Vilgefortz and Stregobor, particularly by the end of the episode and that confrontation that happens with Yennefer and Geralt and the whole Motley crew as they come in and accuse Stregobor of going after Ciri, murdering all of these women, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So as we get to the end of our discussion and the end of the episode, with The Art of Illusion, we've reached the end of The Witcher Season 3 Part 1. Do you believe this is an effective mid-season finale, and why or why not? Yeah, in my opinion, I think it works really well. You have a lot of drama, you have the conclusion to this mid-season mystery that we've been building up from the first episode of the season, wrapping up some details that have been lingering from Season 2 and Season 1, while setting up additional challenges for our characters for the rest of the season and also it's it's just got everything that i really love about this show it's got a little bit of self-referential humor it's got some magic it's got intrigue it's got multiple timelines running around and you know you have this scene repeated several times but in different angles where we have yennefer and Geralt re-establishing their relationship coming together and then this romantic conclusion of Geralt finally saying, I love you out loud, especially after everything that we've seen happen for the last four episodes in season one and everything that happened in season two, it feels earned and it feels like, oh, okay, we fu- we're okay now. Yennefer trying to make it up to Geralt and Ciri has paid off and they're able to work together and sort of not erase completely, because maybe that might not ever go away completely, but at least mend their relationship and reestablish their connection in ways that are meaningful to them and come together as a front, not just for Siri, but for each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it had the elements you would want of some kind of finale, especially like mid-season. Obviously, the big reveal about that Stregobor is not who we think, who it seemed like he was being set up as, and that Vilga Forts is, you know, the realization with that. Also somewhat even of a sum up, because you see all these people who are introduced throughout the season mm-hmm. and previous seasons, and they're all together now at 
this party. So we get like a little inventory of them and their dynamics with each other. As Michelle said, I think the Geralt and Yennefer saying, I love you to each other. Although I don't remember if Yennefer said it in the series, but, and I thought that was kind of interesting too, because um, they gave us like this moment of like sincerity, which I felt like was cool against, it was like a huge contrast against the background of the event and its attendees, which are all just very fake. And then even just Geralt's usual thing, who's pretty dismissive and sarcastic about most things. And Yennefer was pretty like fickle herself, like all the other sorcerers. And here they have like a very like sincere moment. And now they're working together again in like a personal capacity and on their mission. So we have like the duo back together. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, it is a good setup for the next half of the season. Yeah, I think you both summarized that beautifully. I think that everything that we've seen in the last four episodes builds up perfectly to 305 in regards to the way that the pacing goes. It like culminates really nicely in this single location episode. We also see that all of the mystery is established and then resolved, sort of, <laughs> like in this episode, you know, red herring aside, they do get to the bottom of it by the end of the episode. So it does have a lot of payoff while simultaneously, as you said, Oleg, like being a sort of like summary for and a recap for everything that we've seen so far. So I feel like in those regards, it makes for a really effective mid-season finale. And I think it's very fun, a nice build up. We get all the political intrigue that we want and all the characters interacting together that we don't normally see, which is just enjoyable to watch. And then the episode ends on, I think, an appropriate cliffhanger for both the episode as well as the entirety of part one, where we know something's about to come. We are about to learn the direct effect of Geralt's neutrality and what this means for, I think, the entirety of the continent as well. Um, so I think lots to look forward to in The Witcher Season 3 Part 2 when it comes out. By the time this episode comes out, it would have come out already. But for us recording, it'll be out in another two weeks. So Ooh. we'll have to wait to see what happens ah. after Part 1. But yeah, so as we get to the end of the episode, do you guys have any final thoughts on The Witcher 305, The Art of Illusion? Alyssa, I'm curious about what your Thanid outfit would look like if you could do oh. something. <laughs> I mean, I'm very happy with, like, the dress that I have on right now. Ooh, yeah. Oleg, Michelle, and I are appropriately dressed for this podcast recording that's mostly audio. Yeah. Um, but I can assure you. <laughs> you were <it> appropriately. <laughs> <laughs> we are all in formal wear to celebrate Thanid. Yeah. I am very fond of this $99 dress that I got a few weeks ago because it looks unreal like in person because the sequins on it change with the lighting and with the angle so they go from a copper to a green to a purple depending on where you're standing and how you're yeah. looking at it which I think is super neat I feel like I'm in the realm of like my challenge for right now for, like I am limited by my own imagination I think <laughs> and I would love to have something but yeah just was completely that felt absolutely magical like yeah. you don't know how it's staying up it has all sorts of like not weird bits and bobs but like architectural elements would be really Ooh. awesome um of some kind so yeah something in that realm but in regards to what's actual and what's realistic i am in love with this gown that i'm wearing for the idea it looks pretty added. great thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely a score on on your part <laughs> what would you guys wear borat speedo <laughs> the monokini no, I... or whatever it is well, yeah. i think all you have to do to make it witcher is just put chiffon over it and, and then still have your nipples out it. like that's yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can go with the borat speedo you just yeah. have to have chiffon and like and tool <laughs> i would totally yeah. do gerald's thing like even here for like formal stuff it just looks yeah. really comfortable like for a yeah. formal thing yeah, yeah the pleats gerald's and the stuff. sleeves would probably allow for more movement as well yeah this like thing yeah, yeah. totally and you michelle I would wear a dress, not unlike this one that I'm wearing now, but instead of it being a sort of bluish teal, it would also be sort of bluish teal, but where you can project on the dress glimpses from other dimensions at random. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's like Cat Kingdom is playing out a scene on my dress, or <laughs> like there's someone 
picking dandelions in a field and that's just sort of playing out on the dress so it would be it would be very trippy and probably enhanced by whatever was in the wine (laughs) it's like a window into the multiverse yeah so then it would also be like an instant conversation piece where instead of being like great party we could be like wait what there's a whale universe like yeah i guess (laughs) so you know just something a little bit more interesting than what I would usually do at a party, which is stand at the corner by the cheese and just kind of (laughs) stare awkwardly at everyone. (laughs) To be fair, the appetizers are the place to go stand at any party. (laughs) Yes. And then you can kind of like talk to people as they come up to you instead of being awkward in the middle of everything. (laughs) Imagine your dress though crosses signals. (laughs) You just get like a random like reveal of like Vilgefort's planting shit on Stregobor or something <laughs> like whoa yeah <laughs> there goes the plot yeah. <laughs> oh no all on Michelle's dress <laughs> just cut to credits just, immediately <laughs> just saved us a lot of time in sleuthing guys <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness I love that though like yeah the magical element is so fun the medieval element is very fun yeah super super great so like one thing I noticed in the um, book description, because, you know, Russian people hate draft. We call it skvoznyak. And it just uh-huh. we had a whole conversation yesterday with family mm-hmm. about it. But Geralt hated one of the things he didn't like. It was like very drafty in the palace. Mm-hmm. And then I was like looking for that element in the show. And, and I thought it was pretty cozy. But then one time they panned up, I think there was no roof, right? It yeah. was just uh, like yeah. a little circle. It's just there. an open ceiling. I feel like it's one of those things that they could have pushed the dresses where, like, there's no wind, but, like, somebody's dress is just billowing completely magically for no reason. I'm like, that would be so cool. That's a good idea. (laughs) I love that idea. I'm just thinking production-wise of, like, a random fan in the background would probably be a lot of noise and Or just right under somebody's skirt and then just... It would have to be an extra who wasn't miked, I think. Yeah. One of the pirates of the Caribbean, remember they had Orlando Bloom's mm. father and his crew that are cursed and they're all like just flowing all the oh, time. Yeah. They're in some kind of... That's very cool. <laughs> like that effect, maybe. <laughs> Love it. So it's been so nice to have you guys on. But that is it for our show today. Michelle, Oleg, thank you guys so much for joining us for this episode. And thank you to Hansa for listening. So where can people find you both? And is there anything that our community can help you with or anything that you'd like to share with them? Well, you can find me at Michelle M. Morley. That's M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E-M. And then another M-O-R-L-E-Y. And then down below, you'll see two other Instagram accounts that I run, which is my resort wear collection. Well, actually, I don't run that collection Instagram. My friend does, but you will see more of my stuff on there if you want. And then another one that I do run is just for fun, where I kind of experiment with upcycling and cosplay sometimes when I can remember to upload it. And another Instagram account that I run is the Kovacha account. And that is at C-O-V-A-C-H-A, then studios. So it's very basic. <laughs> I, I hate running things on Instagram. So I post whenever I remember to. And, you know, there it is. But if you want to follow those accounts, great. If not, great. <laughs> they just they just exist if you want to check out what I'm doing. Well, you can also find Michelle in the Hansa Discord where she's incredibly active, too. So if you don't see her on Instagram, you can yeah. definitely find her there on Discord. Definitely. What about you, Alec? I mean, I think your guys' time would be a lot more fun if you spend it on Michelle's social media. <laughs> <No>. But, <laughs> but uh, if you want to find me um, on Instagram, I have it private right now just because I was getting so much spam. But, you know, if you add me and, and I go on Instagram and I'll see you, I, maybe I'll add you. <laughs> it's uh, Oleg, O-L-E-G underscore C-H-U-C-H-A, like Oleg underscore Chucha. Like it's play on my last. And um, so I play D&D with a very talented group of people. It just happened that way. We have like uh, somebody who's an actor and, and all these people who work with Renaissance Fair and stuff. So a shout out to Amit, Craig and, and Sergio. And also we have a producer and director, uh, Rob Longo is his name. Rob is working on finishing up his horror movie debut called The Husband. Interestingly enough, the monster in it, um, they call it the Lala Lunga, but it's based on Polish folklore. He's a fan of um, Slavic folklore. And specifically, it's uh, Topielica, I think that's the way you pronounce it, um, which just from knowing Russian and some Polish, it's kind of like a drowning woman. Oh, I <laughs> and hate <it's> a... that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but meaning she will drown you. Is it kind of like a Rusalka or something? So from what I've seen in the, the Witcher 
because there's drowners. I think mm -hmm. they're um, based on like Toplenik or something it's called. But this is a kind of, I think, a woman who was wronged or something or broken hearted or something mm -hmm. to that extent. I don't, I don't want to like mess it up, yeah. but it, it's yeah. basically a malevolent water spirit slash demon. And you can find and back uh, Rob's horror film on Indiegogo. So check it out. The Husband by Rob Longo on Indiegogo. It's a very talented guy. Sounds really interesting. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. We love talented D&D groups. We have a number of our own <laughs> at the Hans as well. And that's so cool to like hear more about upcoming film projects and ones that are based around Slavic folklore as well. Absolutely. So that brings us to the end of this episode. And next episode, join us as we continue our discussion of The Witcher Season 3 with Episode 306, Everybody Has a Plan Till They Get Punched in the Face. Ooh. Is that what it's, is oh, that I the name of the episode? That. That's the name of the episode. <laughs> Thanks for joining us at The Breakfast Table. For show notes, transcripts of each episode, and a complete list of our social platforms and listening services, head over to breakfastinbeauclair.com. Breakfast in Beauclair is created by Alyssa from Good Morn. It's hosted by Alyssa. The show is edited by Alyssa and Sherry Guo, with music by Alex Berner. Breakfast in Beauclair is produced by Alyssa in New York City, with Katie the Redhead of Toussaint, Jacob B., Charlotte from Bangor Glamorai, The Original Roach, Libby, John of Riblia, Tom from Australia, Jill Kate the Tabby Witch, Ollie from Sweden, James Carson III, Miriam of Tamaria, Softy, and Lisa C. Special thanks to Michelle and Oleg for joining us for this episode and our international Hansa for their support.